name is Brandon Reddick, and I am the lead pastor here at the Bridge Church, where we exist to develop fully devoted followers of Christ in a multi-ethnic context. It is our joy and pleasure to have each and every one of you with us on this Lord's Day. We realize that you could have gone to a number of different churches here in the Wichita metro area, but you decided to come and worship with us as we worship our God. So we say thank you again for being here. If there is anything we can do for you, please let us know. We want to uh, be a blessing to our community, to you. God has sent us here to be a blessing. So just please let us know. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I believe it's after Psalms, Proverbs, uh, you should be able to find it if you can find those two books. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning with verse number 1. If you don't have it, we'll have it on the screen for you. Here's how it reads according to the English Standard Version. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and, and goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, the, the, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? Dude, it's already been. In the ages before us, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have your seat. Today, we start a new sermon series as we study the book of Ecclesiastes. The search for meaning. Today's sermon is more of an introductory word. I believe there will be something for us to be transformed by. However, you may not leave today talking about how great the sermon was. There are some foundational things that we need to lay as we traverse through the remainder of the book of Ecclesiastes. Jumping right in, let's start first of all with introductory matters, with some introductory matters. Let's begin with simply with the name of the book, Ecclesiastes. It actually, the name, the title of the book, Ecclesiastes, comes from the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The word Septuagint in Latin actually means 70. And it's named that because there were 72 Jewish scholars who worked on the Greek translation of the Old Testament. You may be wondering, why did the Hebrew people need a Greek translation of the Old Testament? Because as you know, the Jews were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They have become Hellenized. They, they, they have become acculturated to the Greek way of life. And so now, part of acculturation 
means that they are learning the language where they are. So now they know Greek better than they know Hebrew. The scriptures are in Hebrew, but they don't know it. So they can't hear a word from the Lord. And so these scholars get together and they translate the Hebrew scripture to Greek. And now we have the Septuagint. The word, the title Ecclesiastes, comes from the Greek word ecclesia, ecclesia, which means an assembly or church. Therefore, when the title refers, is called Ecclesiastes, it refers to one who gathers or convenes an assembly or a church. The one who convenes or, uh, or gathers the church is the preacher. So therefore, Ecclesiastes means the preacher. So then, therefore, as we continue throughout this series, you will hear me refer to the author, the speaker, as the preacher. That's why verse 1 opens with the words of the preacher. That's the title. Well, whenever you study a book of the Bible, it is important to know who wrote the book. Because that may give you some insight into interpreting the book correctly. Who is this preacher? He is not named specifically in the book, but he is referred to many times. Therefore, whenever you have a book of the Bible that does not name its author explicitly, you have to do research based on the internal evidence of the book. By internal evidence, I mean you have to take what the author says about himself and his situation to help you determine who the author is. Do a little research with me quickly. Verse 1 says that the preacher is the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That's the first part of evidence. If you go to chapter 1, verse 12, and it says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Go to verse 16. This is what he says about himself. I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were in Jerusalem before me. Chapter 2, we won't read all these, verses 4 through 8, speaks of the author's accumulation or the preacher's accumulation of wealth, workers, and women. So then, the internal evidence tells us this about the author. He's a son of David. He reigns as king, the wisest to live, and has great riches. Biblical history points to one man who meets all these qualifications, King Solomon. So then, therefore, as we read through the book of Ecclesiastes, we will work under the assumption that the author or the preacher is King Solomon. He is the convener of this assembly. So then, we know the title, we know who wrote it, the question that we must always ask as we study a book of the Bible, by the way, I'm giving you practical Bible study tips. You want to know how to study the Bible? I'm trying to help you right now. By the way, one of the things you can do to help yourself understand a book is to sit down, get on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, flip a gram and every other gram and just read through the book in one sitting so you can understand the author's flow of thought. So we've talked about the title, we've talked about the author, but then the question you must be asking yourself 
as you prepare to read the book, as you read the book, after you read the book, is why did they write the book? And maybe you should be asking, because I told someone this week that we were going to start studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and the question was, how did you get there? And so maybe you may be sitting here this morning saying, why study the book of Ecclesiastes? The author, he gives us part of the reason up front. But then he's not going to finish answering the why until the end of the book. So to keep you wondering, guessing, and coming back, because y'all like to play hooky, I'm not going to answer it all today, but let's take what we know so far. From the sermon series slide, you can deduce that we are going to join this preacher on his search for meaning. Is that not the question every person is faced with in life? Who am I? What on earth am I here for? Is there any point in this thing called life? Everyone is searching for meaning. I personally enjoy the book of Ecclesiastes because it helps us to deal with real life. What the world is looking for in the church is transparency, authenticity. The world is looking for, the, for real truth, for real life. Many of you are in here today. You show up every Sunday saying, Brandon, I need some real truth for the real life that I'm experiencing. Ecclesiastes captures the frustrations of living in a fallen world. And many of us today, we either have experiencing, have experienced, excuse me, are experiencing or will experience a frustrated faith. So then we will see more to come about why Solomon, the preacher, writes this book. So we start with introductory matters. Let's move secondly to the main point articulated. The main point of the book and the main point of this section is articulated in verse 2. Here it is. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. That's the main point articulated. It doesn't take long for the author, for the preacher, to tell us how he really feels about life. It starts on a pretty sour note. All is vanity. Bible study tip again. Already in one verse, we have repetition. This word vanity is mentioned five times in just one verse. When you see repetition, you ought to underline it and say, this is important. I need to understand what this means. What is this idea of vanity? Well, vanity is used five times already in just one verse. It's used multiple ways throughout Scripture. The most common way that the word vanity is translated is meaningless worthless, nothing. And that's the default translation that we will use as we study this book. However, context is king. Because whenever you take the text out of the context, all you have left is a, help me preach this thing. So sometimes he's going to use the word vanity and he means something else. So context is the ultimate determination. But the default way that we will use it is meaningless or worthless. However, vanity is also translated 
throughout the uh, Hebrew scripture as breath or vapor. Why? He's using that word to, to remind us that breath and vapor are temporary. They just don't last. And so we could even say, he's saying, well, one translation, Eugene Peterson, in the message, translator, message translation, he, he translates it this way, smoke. All this smoke. Why would, he, why would we translate it that way? Why would the idea of vanity mean breath or vapor? Because both breath and vapor, not only are they temporary, but they also cannot be grasped. The author will show us how oftentimes in our quest for finding meaning, we try to grasp onto things that are really graspless. So we see meaningly and worthless are one translation. Breath and vapor are another. Another less used translation of the word vanity, but rather significant use of the, of the word vanity is idle. An idol is anything that is worshipped in place of God. And as we study the book of Ecclesiastes, beginning with through even in next week's sermon, we will see the preacher turn to idol after idol and his search for meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment. Let me run ahead and give you a preview. His conclusion after turning to all these idols to find meaning, the one thing he's going to say over and over again is, it's all vanity. Woo, I'm ready to preach already. So verse 2, he gives us the main point. His primary argument of the book, everything is vanity. Everything is worthless. Everything is a vapor. Everything. In other words, he's saying nothing is excluded from ultimately being meaningless. What the preacher is doing is he's just bottom lining this thing for us from the very beginning. He's bottom lining the experience of life. And the rest of the book will be about the author expanding on what it means, expounding, excuse me, on what it means by everything to be meaningless. So his main point in this section and throughout the book, he'll add to it at the end, is everything is meaningless. So now, verses 3 through 11, we go from the main point articulated to the main point argued and illustrated. The main point argued and illustrated. In verse 3, the author asks a rhetorical question. He says, what profit or what gain is there to all man's toil on earth? That word gain, it comes, it's a financial term. It's, it means profit, surplus. What's left over after everything has been paid? That's why he starts with the bottom line. He says, what you get is nothing. The, his, his question is, not just work, but, but what do we get? What's the benefit for all of man's efforts? on the earth. Everything that we do day after day to, to, to provide meaning and satisfaction and fulfillment, at, at the end of the day, what is there left? Is there any lasting legacy? Is there any monument we can build for ourselves so that we can never be forgotten? He, he, he says, what, is, what gain is there? At the end of the day, when this life is over, is there anything left to say we were here? And he's going to say, no. The answer, according to the preacher, is there's no benefit because everything is ultimately meaningless. It's all temporary. 
the author suggests that people do all this work on earth only for things to actually remain the same on earth. Watch the text. He says there is this constant activity by people, but we actually really make no real progress. There's all this motion, but no promotion. Okay, you don't like the point. The preacher knew that, so he says, let me, let me make my case. Look, he says, let me first give you three examples just from physical nature. First, he says, let me illustrate it by way of the sun. He says, every day, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I didn't know that really until I moved to Wichita. Because <laughs> I get on Kellogg in the morning, and I'm, dri and I'm driving east, and I'm like, oh, I can't see. And then I got to go to football practice out on the west side of town at 530, and I'm driving right into the sun. So I learned real quick. Where it rise and fall. It's like that every day of the week. Y'all even post about it on Facebook. You put your little, oh, look at the sun, sunset and all that kind of stuff. The preacher's argument is it happens every day. From the beginning of time, the sun has been rising in the east and setting in the west. The sun is constantly, he says that the sun, it rises in the east and then it hurries to get back to where it started. In other, he, 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 he would say it is chasing its proverb, proverbial tail every day. Okay, he knew you wouldn't like the illustration of the sun. So he said, look at the wind. He said it starts one way, but all it does is goes around in a circle. Nothing changes at all. He knew you didn't like the sun. He knew you didn't like the wind. He said, I know you like some water. He talks about the sea. Verse 7, he says, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they're just going to go there and flow again. The preacher probably had the Dead Sea in mind. The Jordan River constantly flowed into the Dead Sea. And as much as the river flowed into the Dead Sea, the sea never was full. He says it's the same motion over and over again. Nothing is changed. His argument from all three illustrations is that everything is in constant motion, but nothing really changes. Generations come and go. Nature repeats itself constantly. Therefore, his conclusion and his word to us is trying to find permanency in a world that constantly repeats itself is futile, worthless, and meaningless. His word to us today is stop trying to find permanency in a world that is temporary. Y'all don't know this, but this boy is preaching up in here, up in here. His conclusion then, verse 8, he says, as he, looks about, as he looks back on the sun, the wind, and the water, he says, all this monotony is tiresome. He, he says, it wears me out, so much so that I can't even use words to describe it. He says, there is nothing that can satisfy in this life. We're never satisfied with what we see. We're never satisfied with what we hear. We are a people that consistently struggle with contentment. Just think about it. But see, this is October, last month, September. Every September, I wait for one day of the month in September. The Worldwide Developers, Developers Conference for Apple. Yes, I'm that guy. I am an Apple fan boy. 
and I don't care what you think about it. I love me some apple. So every September, apple's going to come out with something. It's been more updates than wholesale changes. But watch this. As soon as the event happens, instead of people enjoying the new update to whatever Apple has put out, the commentary is, well, this is what they didn't get. This is what they didn't add. So next year, and watch this. This is before the stuff has even hit the market. We're already looking ahead to what's the next version. We're never content. We get Facebook, and then we want more and more and more. By the way, I like Facebook. I'm on Facebook. So I want you to think that I'm hating on Facebook. But we want more and more information. We got, I remember back in the day, like I'm real old, but I remember back in the day where you had to sit at your computer, and if you wanted to go to NFL.com, you literally had to wait for it to dial up. Yeah, you remember, there you go. And now, if the page is not there before I take my finger off return, I'm mad. This internet's so slow. It took all the point, oh, five seconds for it to come up. We are a people that's never content. He then makes a second assertion about why everything is meaningless, verse 9 through 10. <laughs> what has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing which can be said, see, this is new? He says, nope. Already been done, buddy. Now, I suspect by this point, some of you are arguing with the preacher. Because I know, trust me, I know y'all like to argue with the preacher. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get the emails, the emails. The comments in small group, oh yeah, I hear about it all. And you're saying to yourself, preacher, how can you say that there's nothing new when there's been all sorts of inventions throughout the span of time? You, and you may be even saying, just think about all the, all the discoveries and the scientific breakthroughs and the medical advancement that's happened. And the preacher, he would actually agree with you. He's saying, yeah, there have been discoveries or there's been advances and there's been all this great technology. But he would argue that at the core of everything in life, what has been is what will be. Think about it. Let's just take something like communication. We've gone from the printing press to typewriters to computers to Kindles. That's an e-book reader, electronic book to cell phones, if you, you can even just take the smell phone, the, the smell phone, <laughs> the cell phone. <laughs> we went from that big, huge thing that you had to carry on your shoulder and tear up your rotator cuff to the flip phone. And I know some of you still, a couple of you still had a flip phone. God bless you. <laughs> to the smartphone. The author says, when you think about something like communication, nothing has really changed about the, fundam the way the fundamentals work of communication. There's a sender, there's a receiver, in between there's encoding and decoding. The methods may have been updated, but at its core, communication has been in existence from the beginning of time. There's nothing new under the sun. What will be is what will be. What's been done has already been done. Now, he's not arguing against technological advances. Well, he's saying that fundamentally, things don't change. Technically, they may change, but fundamentally, they, they don't. The fundamental events of life, such as birth, marriage, death, work, and taxes, remain unchanged from the very beginning. That's what's happening, and that's still happening today. 
So at this point, you may be saying, Brandon, I came here seeking some joy. And this sounds very pessimistic. It's almost depressing. After hearing the preacher talk about everything being meaningless, you may be asking yourself, so is there any point of living life? If everything's meaningless, why not just end it now? Before you arrive at a conclusion, there's a phrase in this section that is crucial to understanding the author's perspective. Remember I told you, one of the key things in studying the Bible is repetition. It happens in verse 3 and verse 9. Look at it quickly. Verse 3 and verse 9 there's a phrase that shows up there again and again. Took too long. That phrase is under the sun. That phrase, it refers to life here on earth. The author is saying, if everything, no, he's saying everything is meaningless under the sun. If you can't find meaning under the sun, then the answer must be above the sun. Ooh, I'm about to run out of here. In your search for meaning, the author says, the preacher says, you cannot look under the sun. The answer has to come from heaven. The key to life is not on this side of heaven. We, we, and, and we may not understand the key to life until we get to heaven. And since we don't have the key, church, then we must trust the locksmith. He knows what's best for us. And it's not until we live life connected with God that we truly find meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment. That's why we say, tell me, what can I do? do. I can't live without you. I can't be without you. I can't walk without you. I need you. Sermon in a sentence. Apart from God, there is no meaning in life under the sun. All of our toil and efforts on earth are like a vapor. Friends, It's not until we surrender to Christ that we can have the assurance that our work is not in vain. Through Jesus Christ, our work, our effort, our toil can have meaning. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he told them to be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that, watch this, in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. Christ gives meaning to our life. Christ gives meaning to our work. Christ gives meaning to everything. And friends, at the end of the day, only what you do for Christ will last. You may be here today. You've been like this preacher. You've been searching for meaning. You've tried. You've looked high and low, far and wide. You've tried all sorts of things, drugs and and alcohol, women and men. You've tried all sorts of things, money, work, and you've tried to find meaning and identity in these things, and they've continually failed you. The preacher says to you today, you will continue, things on this earth will continue to fail you. They will be worthless, meaningless, nothing. They will be like a vapor until you give it to God. And so we invite you today to trust in Jesus Christ. The only way to be right with this God that gives us meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment is through his son, Jesus Christ. I performed a wedding on yesterday. It was a beautiful ceremony. At the end, the one thing that I wish I had done was told them that there is another wedding 
that all have been invited to. And it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. His bride has been made ready for him. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Who's his bride? The church. All are invited to this wedding. There is an RSVP required. How do I RSVP to this wedding? How can I be a part of this ceremony? You must completely trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. So you may be here today and you are searching for meaning. And the preacher has helped us understand that apart from God, we will not find meaning on earth. Meaning is only found in Christ. Because in Christ, we, we become a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. In Christ, we receive a new identity. We're not who we used to be. We are now a child of God. We are a saint now. Saint simply meaning we are set apart. We are holy because Christ in us. Christ with us and Christ through us. You may be here today and you may have already trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today you needed to hear that even as a believer, you still struggle with trying to find meaning in things that are ultimately meaningless. And maybe today you just need to repent of trying to find meaning in things outside of Christ. And be secure and rest in what Christ has called you to do. And who Christ has made you and who you are. Let us pray.